My name is Antonia Carcelan Estrada. I am here uh, with a Greenleaf Fellowship doing research on the comparative colonial experience of the Pueblo nations, English and Spanish. And this is work I had done in Ecuador in the past five years where I was based previously. At least I have my PhD in comparative literature from UMass and um, I use disciplines as tools that enable the translation of epistemologies and meanings according to the demands of each world contained in a language. Always hoping to have an impact by strengthening in every way possible. Digital technologies have made this process much easier, um, forcing a reckoning of indigenous contents. And the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that state that indigenous people have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their languages, oral traditions, writing systems, and literature, or the proclamation of the current international decade of indigenous languages have made their dent in making ancestral languages visible. Most importantly, perhaps, by setting international networks of solidarity and a common discourse to fight the long battle against colonialism and epistemicide. But these efforts do nothing to strengthen languages without the active design and implementation of projects by indigenous nations in their territories. Today I want to share some of these experiences in my own decolonial work. I first began working with the revitalization of Quechua 2B, related to the more popular Quechua 2A and Quechua 2C, which if combined is the most spoken language family in Avia Yala, wrongfully referred to as the Americas, North and South. I was applying everything I had learned at school about language, power, and colonialism developing through a politics of listening a decolonial methodology. Is it Lucia Rosera, a picture leader from Peguche, then studying economics, and her brother Sacha, a Nike genius, set a two-faced project for linguistic revitalization through the translation of Don Quixote into Quichua and an online Quichua dictionary with simple lessons for beginners. Literary translation allowed them to narrate themselves. Tiyu Quixote wears a poncho, speaks Quichua, and evokes Antian colonial battles and historical leaders while contributing to a relaxification process that is ongoing. Some neologisms included Umamushkui for fantasy, Ukushka for thought, Wajichina for insult or offense, and Wajichinata Sumagyaichina for undoing wrongs, and the Inca Mascapaicha for crown. The Catalan revitalization was my blueprint of literary translation as a form of linguistic revitalization. The goal was to set Quichua to ensure that in three generations, we too could have physics and literature in indigenous languages, not through bilingual education, but in full immersion which was the result of the nocentisma politics in Catalonia, change the language to change reality. The first president of the Institute for Catalan Studies, Antoni Rubio y Lluch, wrote that at the origins of all people lies in their poetry, the appropriate tool per enunciar el non dit, to enunciate what cannot be said, what has been silenced. In 1892, Anthony wrote to Juan Leon Mera, architect of the post-colonial Ecuadorian national identity, to warn him that he could not speak for the Indians and that true indigenous poetry could only be expressed in Quichua, to which Mera answered that there was no room for civilization in the language of barbarians and that Quichua had no place in schools. This attitude continues to be the common belief among many who replicate power imbalances between post-colonial and indigenous languages, which in the case of Quechua, the useless language, the Yangashimi, resulting in acculturation and assimilation of its speakers and the epistemic starvation of languages cornered to a folkloristic function 
an adornment to Spanish. Sacha then studied in the Basque country where the word was that literary translation was not sufficient to revitalize the language. His training in social linguistics made us shift their energies to set educational programs for pregnant mothers and mothers of young children who now grow with Kichwa radio, TV, newspaper, hip hop in Imbabura where the project was implemented. Lucia became a diplomat and Sacha got deeply involved in local politics and I crossed the Atlantic to Avialala. We tried to keep up with the translation over the years. Um, and we even met in person again in Ecuador during the solstice celebrations of Intirraimi, where it was decided that we would finish the project with the funds from the Cotacachi town hall. But soon, protests erupted, changing once again the priorities of our efforts. The 2019 indigenous protests were violently repressed. This is a common obstacle to the revitalization of ancestral languages, the constant battle for survivance and the destruction of racist and necropolitic systems eat away the energy that is needed for the sustenance of indigenous life. Unsurprisingly, the second most spoken language family is Maya. I do not speak any Mayan language, so my work in this case was to translate Zapatista stories from English, from Spanish to English, so that the sales could be sent to the Tzotzi language school in the Zapatista liberated territory of Oventic. Their cry of Yabasta and all unleashed the war against neoliberalism and against oblivion that has been barely heard by many across the planet. Their proposal, a world where many worlds feed, a notion of citizenship that recognizes equality and difference, not only of ethnicity and race, but of sexuality and gender. Postcolonial limited conceptions of democracy condemns populations to invisibility, their cultural memories to oblivion, and their needs and knowledge to a subaltern status. Thank you. Um, although indigenous people have shaped their continent through their cultural, social, and political practices, they have been systematically omitted from written historical accounts and continue to be sidelined as passive bystanders in contemporary politics. Indigenous leaders may be powerful political actors, but they, fail, they fall into oblivion once their stories are left to orality and indigenous languages are displayed by Spanish, displaced by Spanish, French, and English among the youth. How then are young generations to learn from their ancestors and inherit their resistance to inspire their own future? As they fail to be recognized as forceful political actors, indigenous nations face ongoing violence and dispossession in the face of overlapping forms of racial and gender oppression. Maya and Quechua women have contested this historical invisibility and ongoing violence, claiming their central role as community leaders and nature defenders in fragile and uneven democracies of Central America and the Andes. At each turn of indigenous intercultural translation, a world emerges with their own articulation. Quechua, colonized in the Andes, is a colonial language in the Amazon. Lately, I have worked on the revitalization of a language now dead, Chilipano, the language of the recently recognized Quijos nation, the largest in today's Ecuador at the time of the conquest. The Quijos governor features frequently in the colonial records. Kumanji, their hero, seems to have transmogrified into a board game such as the sem semantic dissonance between indigenous world where things mean one thing and the consumption of a signified red commodified meaning unable to capture resistance. Because resistance remains in the ancestral language, even if dead, like in Spain, Celtic, Iberian, the indigenous language left in the names of rivers, towns, perhaps in Soto Suevi accents. The scholars that study these kinds of things are paleolinguistics, and the Quijos are currently collecting words making sense of expressions where comparative linguistics can, can help distinguish between the Quichua, Naporuna, from the subterranean Chilipano. 
Kiko's invisibility not only results from the nation's and innocentrism, but also from a scholar interest to connect Andean culture to other most researched social scapes, such as the Mayan or the Aztecs. Andean or Caribbean Amazonian relations, however, often seem ignored. In the nation's narrative, the Amazonian region appears marginal to the Andes and the Pacific. Ecuador's visual coloniality, scientific and artistic, positivist and romantic, is reinforced in Kumanda, 1879. In this foundational text for Ecuadorian literature, the great 19th century novel, Juan Leomera uses Humboldt's scientific gaze, the language of Columbus letters, and the colonial relaciones geográficas to open up his poetic novel which takes place in Quijote's territory. This pseudo picaresque Quixotic novel performs the common tale of religious, economic, cultural, and epistemic dispossession at the expense of possessing women and land. The Andean colonizer, economically defeated in Quito, Mala Suerte, goes to the Amazon to try his luck. The narrator measures the landscape wide and high and describes rivers and volcanoes. Seen through the colonial gaze, looking down to the Amazon while standing on top of the Andes, he feels vertigo, but overcomes his fear through his desire to possess the land. Eres dueño de ti mismo y verdadero rey de la naturaleza. Nature becomes his subject, and today the land substrate still belongs to the state. He describes the forest as the green Sahara, barren of civilization, but replete with, quote, customs of savage tribes, end quote. Mera insists that, quote, customs of strength are their only law and revenge is their first of virtues, end quote. Although, quote, there are no cannibals, it is dangerous to travel among them, end quote. In short, Mera conceives Amazonian peoples as revengeful hordes of dangerous savages. There is only one family prone to God and beauty, isolated from savages. Mera uses pastoral language to set a locus amenos as the stage for the rise of the woman to be rescued, Kumanda, the virgin of the sun. The reader, now a spectator, sees the theater where you are about to enter. Mera uses the indigenous virgin, Kumanda, to set a Greek drama on indigenous land, the impossible love with the Catholic mestizo travel Traveler told in neoclassic verse with a folkloric tone. Quijos virgins today still parade to celebrate the goddess of Chonta, the Amazonian Baptist Pacifist fruit. The novel ends with the sacking of Sumanda, Kumanda's tomb, where the mestizo settler rescues the dead body of the sacrificed virgin and takes the gold, of course. Ecuadorian national literature is riddled with cultural dispossession a long-standing tomb sacking waquerismo that in Kumanda's final scene is literal as well as metaphoric. Silvia Rivera Cusicangi argues that while well, ethno-history as a Marxist praxis with a leftist instrumental vision bears indigeneity with peasantry for political purposes, providing an emblematic ornament for the state in enlightened Ecuador unifying all indigenous people as either Quechua servants or Hivado savages, Oral history provides a space for polysemy, with meanings gathered from the body's memories, emerging into a chichi liminal space where the weaving of multiple identities can result from the exchange with another. For Diane Taylor, this embodied memory lies between the archive and the repertoire. Awakened by trauma into a chichi space, me uh, memory reconnects to a mythical time, slow and deep, to perform in public and materialize a silent history. The Quijos passed as Quichua for most of the part of the 20th century. That's what the school and the military, the state's envoys, said they were. Like the military, schools act as agents of dispossession. However, in 1981, in an event where President Rodos Aguilera gave unprecedented recognition to indigenous bilingual education and 17 countries attended to inspect this educational model, Marcos Tanguila, a leader from an Amazonian federation, was told that he was Quijos, not Quichua. At the subsequent consulta, the elders of the community told similar stories and spoke of a different language, Chilipano. 
In just three generations, during the transition from rubber to oil extractivism, the Quijos had forgotten who they were. They could no longer see themselves in the mirrors of history. But the past had arrived to claim its own reordering according to a longer memory scientifically justified by archaeological, linguistic, anthropological research. Oral history comes to supplement this project to reconstitute the Quijos nation, a process that began serendipitously at the dawn of intercultural education at the rebirth of Ecuadorian democracy from the ashes of military dictatorship. The Quijos territory extends from Pipo to Baeza, Hondachi, Cotunda, and Archidona. But only five communities joined forces behind the reconstitution of the Quijos nation, so that collecting oralities and performing a Quijos identity within communities becomes vital for self-determination and the defense of the territory against resource extractivism. For Francisco Grefa, Communitarian Plan y Vida, developed by those who came first to organize the ancestral territory, guarantees self-determination and the sustaining of a Quijos memory and the life of the forest. A Coqui, Asociación de Comunidades Quijos, gathers ancestral knowledge and serves as mediator between the communities and researchers. A Coqui adheres to the regional Confenaye, which is the federal uh, indigenous organization in the Amazon and the national Conaye organizations. Um, so Venancio Huertatoca finds it pleasant to gather ancestral facts, to mobilize past memories and today's community, a double meaning that gets lost in translation from Quechua. Huertatoca continues, in those times, say the elders, they were building the road, yes, the only one. The military wanted to take our territory. 8,892 hectares. Before the road, they had a family-based economy like the one Bayer described. Now they migrate to find work in the Andes or the Pacific. Francisco Grefa participated in 2001 at the two weeks at the Siena University sitting to demand collective rights recognized by Chapter 5 in the 1998 Constitution. Their 2013 title of Ancestral Territory Escritura Común protects 11 million hectares from corporate, church, and military advances. He also witnessed how the elders spoke the other Quichua, Chilipano. For Jason Grefa, who identifies as an empirical musician, their music is a common good. He calls for translation into their Quichua language, not the original Quichua, so that all can communicate in the lost ancestral language now realized. He concludes, we walk as quijos, neither hoisted nor taken down. Quijos women leader Lourdes Hipa explained how her identity as quijos increased after the reconstitution of the quijos nation in 2013, when the state officially recognized them as first nation, nación originaria. She says, la lucha ha sido por la historia, we have millenary roots and we are the seeds of this struggle. The stories of the elder are already gone, already lost. Ironically, Hipa connects her previous Quechua identity to Indians exploited by the many corners of Latin America, people used for election and receiving no support from the state, which told us of the conquest, histories that weren't true. The historical fiction was the only mention of Latin America in the 43 collected oral histories, although Simón Bolívar did feature twice as leader according to public schools. Lupita Grefa from the Napo Women's Organization believes that this constitutional recognition takes them 80% to success, but they still lack a national and international recognition to achieve autonomy. Intercultural bilingual education fails to mention Humandi, his burning of Archidona, or him turning into a jaguar to escape death. Yet the state declared him national hero of anti-colonial resistance on November 29, 2011. Like the military, schools also act as agents of dispossession. Charupi's public school was named after the conquistador, Dia de Pineda, but he preferred his machete education of fishing and hunting. I, uh, I belong to the forest, end quote. Sharupi believes in free education, digital literacy, 
in a way of life that does not focus on the present and extractivist free economy. He believes that deep work of oral histories and their performance in local communities will help revive the nation. Fermin Tanguila concludes, quote, we have our own medicine. Our history is one with the trees, rivers, watusas, jaguars, boas, the Tumaco volcano, the forest itself, end quote. Bilingual schools promote Spanish literacy with Quichua ornamental supplements. Fermin argues that schools don't teach much about the Quichos and that they don't value them. Diana Grefa did not understand the language of her grandmother, Quichua, yet she always greeted Alipunja, Buenos Dias, though in Chilipano it used to be Ish, Samento, who's approaching. Our nuestros ancestros came with their claim. Quote, we too have laws, we too have justice, end quote. She claims that, quote, antiguamente se originaron otras personas, people who stored meteorites in ceramic bowls. There are a number of petroglyphs that require further research. Their call for research, conocerse, led them to say, we are Quijos communities. Here we are, all rich with our lands. Lupita Grefa remembers when a woman left for six months and forgot how to speak Quichua. The women in the community wonder how could she cry at her comadre's funeral in another language. Those who migrate speak Yocando, Creolized, but Lupita does not forget her Quichua language, Creolized with Chilipano. The revitalization of Chilipano is an uphill battle because of this double Creolization. Oral histories tell us about our inner fantasies, but also about the outer reality. Max Luthi proposed that stories present a harmonious world that gives the listener confidence in the future. For Gugi Wationgo, when we tell stories, the images compose the vision of the world that departs from the one portrayed at schools with its psychological violence. Stories protect us from colonial epistemic violence and from the uncertainty of migration. Many languages are lost or dying, but sometimes they revive. It takes three generations to go into hiding and three generations for its visibility to grow into the speakers of languages carrying worlds rebelliously in each poetic expression or song that carries on despite colonial education, ecocide, and epistemicide. And that is why we are here today. Memory is a particular individual manifestation of a collective phenomenal experience, a fleeting connection with the ancestors, an apparition when the living and the dead collide in the stories people tell. This, these stories contain the past that refused to be forgotten. Our memories never belong to us alone. They exist for someone, for something. They stand in relationship to others to reconstitute a hemispheric history from haunted memories requires a praxis of listening to the silence cries throughout the Vialala, a socio-historical learning of time and body to perform new imaginations and language to imagine. It begs a nominal approach to what is remembered. Remembering is a performative and not a hermeneutic enterprise. Like collective memories erased by national history, Trauma hides in the unconscious as unassimilated. The haunting cry compels the living to tell an unavailable truth. Oral history, then, is the story of the dead as much as of the living. Silent souls come with their claim to contest national histories and bear their own versions of the past. That's it. Thank you. I know this is a lot of hard language, I realize. But it was um, written and rewritten and rewritten many times. <laughs> like that. Don't think that I just whoop it up in two weeks for. <laughs> but if you have any questions from your experience and what language can do. Uh, you mentioned that all uh, traditional histories can um, be modern sort of like give get give them their epistemologies back how this is very crazy project right so 
I got put into this project. It's now my project. When I do, that's part of the decolonial methodology of it, right? So you never get to say or this nothing. You get to let go and do what they tell you to do for their purposes. So I do oral histories in all kinds of contexts for all kinds of purposes. But in this case, in the keyhole, they wanted oral history so that we could do comparative linguistics and differentiate the Quechua from the traces of the non-Quechua, which is the invisibilized subterranean language that disappeared from uh, the rubber, you know, beginning of Carr, Rockefeller times, beginning of the 20th century exploitation, when it was the first moment of shock for the Amazon, and the second one, which is from the 70s, which is the oil exploitation, which is the, sh the second shock of colonization, right? So um, in this, these are three generations, and so, in these three generations, for political organizing, you have to speak Quechua because it gives you ben benefits in terms of advancing collective rights. And so your only possibility to organize in the indigenous movement is in a Quechua-centric way, <laughs> mm -hmm. you see. But it's not just the Quechua-centric way, it's also the Andino-centric way of looking at the Andes, mm -hmm. right? Because instead of looking at the Andes, are the mountains, but it has all kinds of geographic and cultural regions. And in the case of the Amazon, it, it, it should be conceived differently because it goes from Paraguay to, to the Caribbean. It's, it's a different um, cultural, ancestral cultural collectivity, let's say, than the Andes, right? So it's completely different, or the coast in, in that way. Um, and so, you see, that's the kind of things that you do. So you know that in Chilipano, you say ish samento. So now you have two things. And so you have ish and then samento. And you know that it means who's approaching, right? Because it's one of those things that the eldest of the elders still remember from when they were little. So these are 90, 80, 100 year old people. Okay, and so you were trying to get from them anything. And so now we have collected about 2,500 words. And then you can get from this, you can say also, ish, samento. So in order to do this, you have to interpolate. So you know that there is something grammatical about that. So then you go and you, speak, you find what is the wrong Quechua that they speak and see the order of that substrate grammar, and then you take that grammar and implement it with the words that you're finding to recreate literally from the dead a language. That's paleolinguistics. And so that's what they want me to do, which is insane. And so I did my best, and, um, and, but it is, uh, it is a, also a project that while well, this is happening, that every time you have this performance of Quijos identity, more Quichuas realize that they are Quijos, right? And that's important because Quijo, Quichua is a colonial language in the Amazon. And we don't understand the complexities of indigeneity oftentimes, right? And so, um, you know, there's all kinds of levels of complexity about a colonization, and so this is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so, if you are claiming the territory, you cannot have a colonial language, be it indigenous or not. <laughs> so then, this is also a project for the reclamation of the territory as we have a memory, we have a language, we were not the Naporuna, we did not come with 20th century rubber colonization, we were the ancestral people from the colonial times, from the historical records and the Humandi, the burning of Artidona, and so he's, he's proved that we exist, that we are who we are, right? The fact that Humandi was decapitated. <laughs> because in the historical records, so in the oral histories, he never dies. In the oral histories, he turns into a jaguar, sometimes into a snake. But in the colonial record, they decapitated him and all the protesters, all the indigenous protesters, because they burned down the capital so that it wouldn't be conquered, right? So um, they, in the colonial record, 
they every year took the heads for the celebration of Corpus Christi. Like for years and years and years, because this is 1535 is when they start fighting, 70s is when they burn Artigona, and until the end of the 80s, 1580s, they are still parading the heads of Kumandi uh, and Bento, which is the other um, uh, rebel. And this is all under Quijo's identity, right? So there's no Quichua's there then. And so that's why the, the complexity of the project, right? So it also mm, connects at, at the moment that they say, we are uh, Quijo's, you also, I mean, it also opened for a gender reform because the Amazonian societies are super, super messed up if you're a woman. And so, like, for example, when we did the first workshop of oral history with just women, then the men were like, well, we, we have histories too. And it's like, yeah, we know your histories. Like, that's what we did the past three times. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And no, no, we did several workshops about that. And like, well, now we're gonna, and so we had this workshop, but it was super funny because we were doing the workshop, but we were still surrounded by the men all around us watching us, no, do the workshop with the women. But eventually it was time to change. And now Lourdes became the new president of the Quijos. And she was the first, obviously, the first woman ever. And then, it was her, the president, when the protest happened, and so she um, accidentally, I guess, became an important figure in the national uh, indigenous Kanaya, right? So then she's in, like, in, the, in the, the debate tables with the international relations, the French envoy of the United Nations, you know, negotiating with the government for peace. So, it's very interesting um, the things that these projects can do, you know, and how playing with memory and language um, can take you a very long way in, in very creative ways that are not the usual channels to confront the state violently, in which case you're gonna lose, right? So, yeah. Any other questions? This is a crazy project, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think at some point you mentioned something about migration, but it was not clear how it was related. Maybe like, are they like, yeah, it's totally related, related by yes. enforcing the relationships to the land? It is absolutely related to the relationship to the land. So, you have a road, right? I refer to like that joke that he gets, yeah, it was the only one that was the road. And so they have this road, and it was built to take out the oil, right? It was the only reason why they built that. And, and, and it was like that until recently. And then recently, they took the, they made more highways, and then they developed the Amazon, right? This is in the past 25 years. And this came with huge mining contracts and a re renovated oil drilling, interest because we were going the opposite way. We were going all ecological, we were gonna leave the oil in the ground and whatever. And so then there was all this conflict of the development of the Amazon and that brings migration. So the kids migrate, for example, if you want to study, right? You have your shitty bilingual education thing, but you don't have a school that teaches you, I don't know, anything really. And so then you have to go somewhere else to do your high school. So then you have to migrate locally, right? So you go from your community and then you have to like leave the, uh, the jungle, I guess, education and then go to this institutional education. And so then, then you have to go to college and then you have these national exams and your grades only give you to go study in a lot for example. But usually their grades, because there's no universities in the Amazon, place them in the coast. So then they migrate to the coast. And in this process of migration to the coast, they also become economic migrants, not only education migrants. 
And so there's a lot of going back and forth, and not international migration, but intranational migration that's seasonal. Um, and so then there's that. But there's also this other migration that go, comes inward with uh, sex trafficking, with uh, narco warfare, with oil extractivism, with the militarization of the territory, with, uh, and other indigenous groups too. And so then the women are like uh, highly vulnerable because it's Kumanda all over again. It's like all the men are gonna try to get with the women to get to the territory. And so, um, yeah. So yes, it has everything to do with the territory. So it's it's very complicated. But I had I had been in many 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 places where the other women were like, no, because we already have our organization of Quechua women, you see, and we already have all these things and all these institutional memory and connections and and we're and so. In a way, I was trying to tell them, well, be both, you know, <laughs> because it's it's hard economically too. So this project of changing the gender perspective in the community and in the oral histories also intended to uh, provide economic solutions. So, for example, um, sell their their arts and crafts directly and have some income because usually women don't have capital income, right? They're dependent on the man who works and, and stuff like that. So um, that was another component of the project. And it's only half successful. So for that, we had to bring all the Quechua arts and crafts and be like, OK, but for this project, we're going to be Quijos. And like, you know, that was very difficult, the, the economic part of it with the Quijos. Because they didn't want to. They're like, no, I'll start, but I'm Quechua. <laughs> I'm not going to join it, you know what I mean? It's crazy. It's very touchy-feely, and you can't do it. Like, you just do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you don't get to decide. <laughs> See? Yeah, it, that's where it led us. It's, it's, it's an incredible, an incredible project, really. So is, is there an official representation of the Kehos at the United Nations? Uh, during the indigenous uh, assembly? Or? No, but, but they were in the COICA, in the uh, international organizations of different indigenous organizations in the Amazon from all the countries, uh -huh. the Brazil, Colombia, Peru, that one. Uh -huh. And the COICA, because of the 2019 protest in Ecuador, it immediately went to Chile. I don't know if you remember. And after Chile, it immediately went but so it also went to uh, to Peru, and so they started connecting a lot. And and she was uh, uh, one of the main leaders, let's say, in those later conversations of what will be the next twenty-year Coica priorities to organize internationally too. So it has yeah, it has hardcore implications just to have that recognition of being a nation, you know, like that's. So, so your your project, your research will serve right. that? The revitalization of this new nation. Okay. Right. Right. But only doing oral history. So I go and I do a different oral history project, uh -huh. like workshop, according to the needs of that. For example, the women, right? But after the women, there were, as I eventually, after like three and a half years, we finally had the elders. And that is just exquisite. Because then it's true storytelling, you know, like they, they take their time to take the stories and it's only mm -hmm. or, oral literature, let's say. Mm -hmm. They don't go into the politics or mm -hmm. none of that. It's just telling the, the old stories and telling them um, naturally and at length so that we can do the discourse analysis for the comparative linguistics part. But, and that those, my idea was to put them bilingually and make graphic novels, right? Because that's what the Canadians do, yeah. But anyway, I won't hold you anymore. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you liked it.